when Rick Wilson broke from his party and decided to speak out about their chosen candidate, he thought his career was over. But there was another aspect to his decision to lead with integrity. You know, I'm a fairly bright guy, but there were times I felt like I'm the biggest dumbass in America. But weirdly enough, sometime in like mid-16, I woke up one morning, I was like, I just slept eight hours. And I hadn't slept eight hours in probably <laughs> 25 years. And, and I realized slowly but surely that telling the truth about what was happening and peeling back the inner workings of an organization and a party and a, and a political structure that I played my part in building was profoundly liberating. Rick's going to tell us more about that liberation and the sometimes scary path he took to get there on this episode of Timeless Leadership. This is Timeless Leadership, where we explore the values and principles that drive extraordinary leaders. We look for the timeless virtues that are just as relevant in the 21st century as they were in the first century. Universal truths that will help make us better versions of ourselves. Today's show is a little bit different. Hi, by the way, this is Scott Monty, and welcome to Timeless Leadership. We don't usually talk about politics here. And really, this episode isn't about politics. It's about human nature. And if you understand human nature, that will certainly help you understand politics a little more. But fundamentally, I was drawn to Rick Wilson because of his integrity. It's something we see so little of these days. It was so refreshing to see him kind of break out from others uh, a few years ago. And it recently came back on my radar. And I'm going to talk with Rick about that just a little bit. But no matter where you sit on the political spectrum, left, right, center, I hope that you'll take the time to listen to this conversation and listen underneath uh, some of the positions that Rick takes and understand the whys and the wherefores and the principles behind why he made certain decisions in his career in the last half decade or so. So let's get right to it. Rick Wilson is a renowned political strategist, media consultant, and co-founder of the Lincoln Project, an influential political action committee formed in 2019. Known for his sharp wit and acerbic commentary, Wilson has been a prominent figure in American politics for over three decades. Starting his career in Florida, Rick quickly made a name for himself as a skilled campaign advisor, working with Republicans at the state and federal levels. He's played a key role in numerous high-profile campaigns, demonstrating a unique ability to blend traditional political strategies with innovative media tactics. As a co-founder of the Lincoln Project, Rick Wilson has been instrumental in its mission to promote principles over party politics. The organization quickly gained attention for its hard-hitting ads and unapologetic stance against the betrayal of American values within the Republican Party. Rick is also an author of the New York Times number one bestseller, Everything Trump Touches Dies, in 2018, followed up by Running Against the Devil in 2020. In addition to his writing, Rick is a frequent contributor to various national news outlets where he provides analysis on political and cultural issues. And he has a podcast, Rick Wilson's The Enemies List, He's an active Substack writer. 
Rick Wilson, welcome to Timeless Leadership. I, I like the big music bed underneath that. It makes me feel very, very, very uh, panoramic, very <laughs> sweeping, big. <laughs> well, it's audio only, so you'll have to impress people with your voice, which you do a great job of. But um, I do my best. <laughs> I felt like we needed something a little nefarious, something a little grandiose there, because uh, that's pretty much what you're up against. So, it, yeah, it, it, it really is. It really is a I mean, that's that's actually a perfect way to describe the movement uh, that that America's up against. It, it's grandiose. It's over the top. It's so dramatic and so big and so noisy that we often underestimate the seriousness of it because the clownishness and the and the noise and the spectacle can obscure how dangerous it is. And yeah, that is a really good point and i think you've been saying this more frequently of late uh, listen to what they are saying listen to the words uh, you know forget the imagery and the buffoonishness out there uh, they tend to mean what they say it, this is this is a, a point i i have made and made and made and made and made that republicans tell you what they're going to do you know, when, when, when Roe versus Wade was overturned, I had a lot of Democratic friends who were, they were shocked, they were appalled, they couldn't believe it. Oh my God, how did this happen? And I said, you didn't listen for 50 years when the Republicans told you every single election cycle, we're going to stack the courts and overturn Roe. And by the way, uh, we're going to also stack the courts and overturn Roe. And our plan is to stack the courts and overturn Roe. They said it over and over and over and over again. And when people ignore it uh, right now, when they say, we're going to put our political enemies in jail, we're going to expand the power of the president, we're going to deport 10 million people without a constitutional basis, we're going to... Uh, skip what the rule of law would say we should do and just do what we want. When all these things are put in your face a hundred thousand different times every day and you look away from it, that's on you, not on them. They are telling us very, very clearly exactly what's coming down the line. Yeah. And, you know, if anything, it's almost a case of projection that the Democrats weren't as imaginative or didn't uh, think that, uh, you know, this this could actually be brought to completion because, let's face it, the Democrats have really had difficulty doing a lot of that in the past. They've had problems with messaging, um, and the Republicans haven't. And there tends to be this projection from one side to the other. Each side does it, uh, and it is uh, just uh, almost amusing to watch if it weren't so dire. Um, when they project back, there's the, the the constant cycle of Republican communications is this. It is inversion and projection. Um, if you if you bring a fact to light about any behavior or policy or or attitude or character trait of Donald Trump or any other Republican, they will immediately invert that and put that trait back on their either the the, the person who's bringing the accusation or the Democrats more broadly. So whenever you hear, you know, someone say, well, Donald Trump was, is, you know, obviously corrupt given the number of, of, you know, legal cases he's facing right now, they will say, oh, the Biden crime family, it's so much worse. And, right. and all of these things are predictable. All of these things are, are knowable in advance. All of these things are, are explicable, but the Democrats still rely on two things that don't work anymore. Um, they don't work on um, a, a, a basis where you can shame Republicans into, into better behavior. Mm -hmm. You can't say to them, um, you can't say to them nothing about, um, you know, what you're doing is traditionally Republican. They don't care. You can't say to them, uh, you need to, you know, ask yourself, is this who you are? They don't care. They say it outright that this is who they are. Um, and so when we have a, a a world where the Democrats still try to argue with Republicans on what the Republicans used to be, or at least what was their aspiration to be, you know, limited government, the rule of law, the Constitution, you know, in, 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 personal responsibility, fiscal, you know, discipline, personal integrity, all those things. When you try to say to them, 
you know, you're, 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 you've departed from those principles, they'll laugh at you now. They don't care. Yeah. This is this is a world that is completely reborn for them, and and to their credit, to their credit, as operators, the Republicans have brilliantly weaponized this behavior. They understood how to weaponize it, and and the Democrats have still not caught up. And so, you know, even people in the in the news media who definitely know better. They still sort of treat Trump sometimes like, oh, you know, you should take him seriously, but not literally. You should, you know, isn't he an amusing troll? It, it's it's not trolling. It's not funny. Um, and what he's promising and the people around him who are more serious and more considered and more effective will weaponize his desire for a, and let's just say the F word, it's, it's fascism. They will weaponize that desire. They will implement it. And then the country will not look like the America that we believe we know. That's, uh, that's a lot to take in. Um, and it's I'm heavy. a ray of sunshine. It's, I know you are. <laughs> See, bring, bring back that soundtrack. Okay. Um, and this is, this is part of the, the problem I have. And I want to go in a couple of different directions here. A friend of mine, actually a previous guest on the show, Tom Morris, who is a... Uh, a practical philosopher, believe it or not, if, if okay. such things can exist. Former philosophy professor at Notre Dame, became a public speaker, wrote an array of books. He wrote a wonderful book at the urging of Norman Lear um, mm-hmm. about 10 years ago, and he just put out the second edition called The Everyday Patriot. And uh, he opens with citizenship isn't just a legal status. It's a moral calling. And proper patriotism isn't mm. just a feeling, but a moral commitment that can guide us throughout our lives. And that's, that's that. one of the reasons I wanted to talk to you, Rick, is because you wrote an essay, and you, you re-upped it on your Substack. Uh, specifically, it was uh, revisiting the essay that killed my career, because <laughs> you basically took a stance on integrity and you abandon the, uh, the, the, the party in favor of the country, which it seems like so many people are not willing to do. It's almost like we've picked a sports team and once a Yankees fan, always a Yankees fan kind of thing, yeah. which as a Red Sox fan kills me to say, by the way. Um, <laughs> but uh, talk to us a little bit about what caused that rift initially. What caused you to say, you know what, I'm standing up for principle over party. You know, Scott, this is one of the hardest questions. Um, when you, when you look back on, on your, your personal history and anything, you know, everyone's the hero of their own narrative. But I, when I saw Trump come down that escalator, uh, something in me that had been sort of brewing up over several years before broke me. And, and look, I, I was a very successful consultant. I made a lot of television ads. I wrote a lot of stuff for a lot of people. I was a guy you called in uh, if if the problems were, were so stinky and so bad that you needed somebody who just was an operator. And, and I was good at it. I did a lot of super PAC work. I did a lot of candidate work. I worked at every level of, 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 of campaigns and government. And... I had started to deviate from the party a bit over gay marriage. Both my sisters are gay um, back in the mid two thousands. Uh, and I, I approached it from a libertarian perspective where I just, I said, how in any world is it the government's business that can, what consenting adults marry other consenting adults? Um, and, and I had felt even though I was, I, even though you, you, you know, as a consultant, you played the game, you worked the, you worked the game. Um, I, I had this feeling of, of in the post Tea Party era, that there was something darker rising up. And in 2012 and 14, I saw in some statewide campaigns in Florida, Michigan, uh, Washington, and elsewhere, this weird conspiratorial, ugly edge that was brewing up and some of it was overtly anti-Semitic. Some of it was cr- just crazy. And, and I felt like the dominance of that movement uh, among the grassroots was setting us up for something very bad. 
So when Trump came down that escalator, a bunch of things clicked in my head at one moment and I started to be very critical. I was supporting Marco at the time. I was doing a Marco super PAC um, that a bunch of very wealthy folks wanted to help Marco become president. And I didn't take it on because of Marco. I took it on because of the country. And then of course, Marco flamed out very quickly thereafter. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> but I started speaking out. I started telling the truth about who Trump was. And initially, a hundred percent of the Republican party apparatus, the people I'd known for years were like, go get him, man. F- screw that guy. Good for you. Let's, you know, r- let's bring the Rick Wilson heat and, and take this guy on. <laughs> and, and then they started to fall away and then they started to disappear. And then they started to say things like, don't call me. I, you know, if, oh. if I say something against him, you know, you know, what's going to happen to me. I live in cause I, I don't live in DC. I haven't lived in D.C. since the 90s. Um, and, and so my very good practice, my very my, my terrific business I had sometime in the spring of 16 just disappeared. Like every client I had was calling me like, we have to we have to terminate. We have to hire somebody else. Sorry, you oppose Trump. That must have been terrifying. It was terrifying because, you know, like like a lot of people, my burn rate with a family and everything else and, 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 a, and staff and, and my operation could not be sustained with no income. And so I lost almost everything. I almost lost my house. I mean, the crash happened really fast. I mean, really fast because, you know, I gave up what I had built for 25 years. I, I, I burned my own company to the ground. It was horrifying. It was humiliating. I didn't understand why I was like seemingly the, the, the goat that had been slaughtered in this thing. And then I did get it. I understood that all these people in DC, all these other consultants were like, yeah, I hate Trump, but I'm going to pretend I hate Trump, but I'm going to, I'm going to milk it, get my guy in office, you know, blah, blah, blah. And you know, I'm a fairly bright guy. But there were times I felt like I'm the biggest dumbass in America. But weirdly enough, sometime in like mid 16, I woke up one morning. I was like, I just slept eight hours and I hadn't slept eight hours in probably (laughs) 25 years. And, and I realized slowly, but surely that telling the truth about what was happening and peeling back the inner workings of an organization and a party and a, and a political structure that I played my part in building was profoundly liberating. Um, wrote the first book in 17. Uh, it was a number one bestseller, a big hit that kind of changed my life, put things back on track a good bit. Um, but I realized I was never going to really go back into, um, the Republican world again. I understood something profound for all of the people at the base who demand ideological purity and who demand perfection of, of belief and policy and no deviation from the great, the the great work and the great movement. They sacrificed everything. They, they gave up on limited government and the constitution and the rule of law and fiscal responsibility and strong foreign policy. And they replaced it with the adoration of a, of a con man. They replaced it with a, with a set of, of almost comically evil behaviors and beliefs by Donald Trump. And, and I didn't want to be a part of that. I know a lot of people, um, who are in my cohort in the party structure who, who played ball and their lives since then have been a long horrible misery because they're always living in fear. The minute they make a mistake, the minute they tell the wrong person that they're just playing Trump, the minute they tell anybody that, that, you know, Trumpism is a lie, they'll be in the situation I was in before, but without the benefit of, of a reboot that was clean and real. And look, I rebooted my life in a lot of fundamental ways. Um, the, my kids were the subject of, absolutely horrific, unbelievable, 
personal threats and attacks um, that that steeled my commitment to beat these people forever. Um, you, you know, we had we had national Republican media and conservative quote unquote conservative media folks joking about my daughter being raped. Oh my God! And and it it made me hard, and and honestly. I am a genial person as a rule <laughs> and people who work with me know that, and this has been the case for, for my, most of my career. I am very easy going. I demand a, a high standard from people, but I'm very easy going. I'm not a yeller. I'm not a screamer. I'm not a temper tantrum guy, but if you see me get angry, run for the damn Hills <laughs> because when it comes out, it comes out bad. And yeah. that was the emotion that the attacks on my kids and 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 uh, just set me off and i realize these people will play as dirty and as hard they don't care about family they don't care about the rules because in my in my in my long career in politics i was a hard hitter i was a pipe burning guy i was the guy you called in to melt people's faces i never once not once in my career went after a civilian or the children of a candidate that weren't involved in the process. Yeah, and that, that only and the things they did to my kids, it, 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 it made me, it made me profoundly, um, you know, disgusted and shocked at first, but I realized this is a movement that will destroy anything in its path, including this country, including our constitution, including this Republic, unless people are willing to be brave and stand up and walk out in public and take the shots and take the garbage and, and take the financial loss of, of, of opposing this. And the irony is it turned out to be the jaded cynical hack consultants like me and <laughs> Stu Stevens and Reed Kalen, who were the guys who said, we're not going to deviate from the real beliefs that we had for years and years. We're going to fight this thing. It, it really has been a, 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 a strange and shocking journey. We're going to pause here a moment for a quick word from our sponsor. You're here because you're interested in personal development and professional development, I would say, as well. And many people, as they seek to develop themselves professionally, seek out MBAs. Well, MBA programs can be expensive. And as you know, the financial investment can take years to recoup. And it means taking time away from your job that results in a loss of income and stalls your career progression in the shorter term. Well, there's an answer to that now with Augment. Augment is an online alternative MBA that's taught by founders of Wikipedia, Shazam, Waze, YouTube, and more. There's hundreds of students who are already using the lessons of this program to take the next step in their careers. It's 100% self-paced. You get a certification signed by the founder of Shazam when you've completed it. And the curriculum along the way is what you would find in some of the best business schools, business and strategy, marketing, innovation, entrepreneurship, leadership, management, and more. As you know, I'm a big proponent of lifelong learning. And when you learn from people who have been there and done that, you're getting information that is relevant and information you can trust. I'd like you to check them out at augment.org where you can get your alternative MBA for 50% off the regular program fees. All you have to do is go to augment.org and use the code Monty Scholarship, all one word, Monty Scholarship at augment.org. Isn't it time for you to take the next step in your career without breaking the bank? I, I guess... It, it's it's difficult for people to imagine giving up a life that they've built. Um, yeah, you know, change is always hard. You know, that's just human nature. But sure. when when it comes to sticking by your values, having integrity, living with authenticity, it's difficult in the face of fe of peer pressure. But at the same time, 
when you're lying to half of the people you deal with and telling a different story to the other half, it's difficult to keep those two right. faces of yourself together. And the people that are speaking one way in private and another way in public, I mean, I, I don't understand how they can live with themselves, how they can justify their behavior. And that's, I guess that's my question is, all of this is happening, they're, they're attempting, to what end? What is the purpose of this money, lustful grab and for fear. power? Yeah, look, look, Washington is a specific culture, and it's driven by two big motivating factors, money and position. Look, being a consultant in D.C., uh, being a consultant out anywhere, you know, if you're good at what you do, um, is a is a lucrative profession. Not gonna, I'm not, I'm not going to mince any words about it. Being a consultant in D.C. can be a routine seven figure, you know, a quarter kind of deal. And they, uh, one of the one of the early excuses I got from a lot of my former friends was, "Hey, man, I got a mortgage to pay. I got kids in college. I've got, um, <clears throat> I've got a business to run. I've got employees. We've got a building." And, you know, I don't like him, but I got to play ball. And, yikes! you know, a lot of them did survive that way. A lot of them, a lot of them were able to um, still, you know, uh, manage to hold their heads up and go into work every day. I couldn't, but a lot of them did. There's another thing in D.C. that there's a belief that you are the vital man, that you are the vital woman, that you are the single person who is going to be definitive in a campaign or a legislative fight or the white house. And there were a lot of people, including some very close friends of mine who went into the administration and they said things like, I'm going to steer the ship. I'm going to help control the craziness. I'm going to channel his tweets into conservative policy. And <clears throat> for all those folks, one by one, they discovered the Wilson rule of everything Trump touches dies. Um, and and I, I repeatedly told them and warned them, I'm like, you will be destroyed. Your reputation will be wrecked. Your life will be over. You're either in his cult or you're doomed. And if you leave, they will destroy you. They will never forgive you. And there was an interesting moment I had in 2018. I had a, a friend of mine late in 2018 left the the administration and was told, if you do this, you know, we'll 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 punish you. We're you know, you're gonna be you're gonna be destroyed politically. And you know what? They did. They did. Wow. Made him unemployable, essentially. And and I said at the time, I'm like, you know, you you even though you left on what you thought were good terms. You have to understand that even the slightest little variation of adoration for Trump that anyone hears about, they will destroy you. And they did. And, and I feel bad for him. And, and he really literally had to go change his career, went into, went into, went into real estate back out west. And, and God bless him, okay? I think, he, I think he's a happier guy now. But, but nothing about the, the cult-like adoration of of a president like Trump really reflects any kind of American understanding of what our politics is and should be. And it, it, and it, while DC is a separate culture, those two incentives, their money and position inevitably lead to really bad outcomes for, for the people that, that play that game with an amoral character like Donald Trump and Trump is profoundly amoral. His people are profoundly amoral and, and as much as I played hard in, in the game of politics, it was still by a code. It was still by rules. It was yeah. still by a set of, 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 you know, I will come in, I will, I will do this in an accurate, hard, sometimes even brutal way, but I'm not going to lie or cheat. And I'm not going to do something that's going to end up breaking the American system. It's too valuable. Yeah. And I mean, this gets us back to what you mentioned a few minutes ago regarding shame. Shame requires 
you to have a conscience, like you're breaking a code. And if you don't have right. a code or you don't care about the code, then shaming someone into proper mm -hmm. behavior is not going to cut it. And so I, I'm, uh -huh. I'm interested now about the evolution and the development of the Lincoln Project, how it all came together um, on the sure. heels of these uh, realizations from you, these sad realizations. Well, I'll tell you a funny story about that. A lot of us in the sort of consultocracy had been talking amongst ourselves for, well, actually, <laughs> I'll, I'll look back to even a, 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 an amusing note. In 2018, late in the year, just before Christmas, I get a phone call. And it's a, a person very in Trump world. And he says, I got an offer for you. I'm like, what? He goes, stop criticizing Trump. I'm like, <laughs> no. He goes, We'll bring you in. He goes, we'll bring you into the campaign. The pay will be ridiculous. All you have to do is say you saw the light. And he's been a good president. And Holy I'm, cow. Like, I'm not going to do that. And about a couple days later, uh, Reed Galen and I saw each other uh, in D.C. And for a long time, Reed and Stuart and, and other people and I, we, we'd go to these meetings in these beautiful homes in DC and these beautiful apartments in New York and these beautiful offices in Silicon Valley with very well-meaning people who would say, we're going to get rid of Trump by saying he's a loser and he's not a conservative and we're going to get the Republican base back. And, and at this point, you know, I had become the anthropologist of Trump and, and I kept saying, you're out of your effing minds. It's not going to work. None of these people in this elite Republican space had ever met a Republican base voter. They had never met the MAGA hat guy at the rally. They had never seen the nearly religious ecstasy in the faces of the people where Donald Trump is up there feeding them red meat by the pound. And so Reed and Stuart Stevens and Steve Schmidt and a couple others of us had talked about doing something in 2018 that didn't take off. We had, we had, we had some money lined up for it and everything else. And we just didn't, it wasn't, we weren't, we weren't ready to put it together at the scope and scale that it came together. Okay. Um, and then in 2019, the urgency became very, very clear. Um, it, it, and I spent the first part of 2019 writing a book and I, I wasn't out of the game, but I wasn't, you know, every day thinking, you know, what kind of super pack could we build? Um, we started talking about the, the terrain of the pack and what it would do and what it could do. And there was no expectation we were going to raise, you know, a hundred million dollars at that point. We thought maybe we'll raise, you know, half a million dollars a month and we'll be able to go into one state, run some ads. A the initial conception of it was a rather standard looking super pack. Um, it turned out um, we gave us, we gave a speech at the Cooper union almost now now almost four years ago which makes me feel really old um <laughs> a bunch of us came together to make a speech at the cooper union it was myself uh reed steve schmidt uh jennifer horn ron steslo and mike madrid uh we were the founding and and there was another founding member who was not there we were the founding you know the co-founders of the lincoln project I gave that speech to a absolutely full house crowded uh, crawling up the walls and I realized something like, I know this is Manhattan, but people are listening to this and they understand the value of ex Republicans who can communicate with the people who are still behind in the party, who are skeptical of Trump, who are doubtful of Trump, who fear him or who loathe him. And so we built a, a, a model that, address what we call the Bannon line of voters. Steve Bannon, who is, I am no fan of and vice versa, um, said, if these guys get 3% of the vote, Trump can't win. And so my response was, well, hold my beer. And the Bannon line in our target states in the first uh, election in 2020 was between three and 8% of the vote. It was very small numbers. We played the game of small numbers. So he didn't have to go into Wisconsin and win a million voters. We needed to go in Wisconsin and win 70 or 80,000 voters in, 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 in Waukesha County or in Brown. And the Lincoln project did two things. We targeted those people and we produced 
the best ad content in the country. And in my grandmother used to say that false modesty is the worst kind. We made ads that did not look or feel like normal political ads. They weren't ever cluttered with all the supers and titles and, and, and effect garbage <laughs> that defines the most, the, 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 the sort of pedestrian bog standard political advertising. This was, this was a, a really different approach. We did an ad called Morning in America with a U, not the traditional Reagan O. It inverted the Reagan 1984 classic ad. That ad did two things. It set off a cascade of, of support for the organization and donations to the organization that allowed us to be a national campaign against Trump. Um, <clears throat> and it also set off Donald Trump. And I had a moment of utter realization that the minute he started mentioning us by name and attacking us by name, I knew two things. We could beat him and that no one in history had played a game of psychological warfare with a national presidential candidate that had ever worked. And we broke the ice. Uh, within a few weeks, we'd run advertising that convinced him to fire his campaign manager, Brad Pascal. <laughs> <laughs> uh, within a few weeks after that, we realized if we talked about Jared or Ivanka, they would go to Jared and Ivanka and scream. Or they would go to Donald and scream bloody murder and eat up a whole day of the campaign's time trying to respond to it. So we understood how to hack the Trump campaign system and how to hack the White House system. Um, and and to be frank, and we said this before on the record, we had sources in both the White House and in the campaign who were giving us excellent steering on what was working at, to, to disrupt them. And as we got better and better at producing faster and better and bigger ads, um, we had two tracks, the audience of one track, which is you know getting in Trump's head, messing with Trump, setting national narratives in, the, in, the, in that track, and the advertising track out to voters in the States. And a lot of people, they've criticized, looking like, you guys just run big viral ads. Well, you know what, folks? Most people aren't going to see our ads because they're not the targets of our ads. Right. Most people are, who, who watch an ad that we put out on YouTube or Twitter about Trump, what they're not seeing, they didn't see it in 20, or they didn't see it in 22, are the fact that we're running these ads out in the States and there are different content. Most of our ads in Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, and Michigan in 2020 were about Trump to, to voters, were digitally targeted ads to specific voters. They weren't really about Trump qua Trump. They were about Trump and COVID and how it's hurting their families. They were about um, Trump and racism and how it makes their families feel uncomfortable. Nothing a soft Republican hates more than being called a racist or associated with the Charlottesville people, et cetera. We were putting Trump's horrible behavior in their faces. And those weren't the sexy viral ads that got 5 million views. Those were the things that got in their heads. And so, you know, we built this organization uh, on the fly. We raised about $100 million. Contrary to popular belief, nobody made $27 million. We spent 85.4% of the money doing voter contact and communications. Um, Overhead of fifteen percent is pretty is pretty competitive in, in super PAC world, um, and and we beat Trump. And the reason we know we beat Trump is he never stops telling people how much he hated us. And in fact, at the end of the campaign, he asked Bill Barr to investigate us, to go <laughs> after us because we'd beaten him. And so that that. Is the Lincoln Project method in a nutshell? We had some, we had some you know, growing pains. Obviously, everybody knows about them. We went into 2021 um, handling those. In 2022, we had reconfigured ourselves as a um, smaller and smarter and better organization. We refined our technique over and over in testing in small, small, small sample tests, so that by the time we got into the 2022 cycle. Uh, we won 17 out of the 21 races we targeted, um, which, in, again, in politics is a crazy good batting average. Um, and now we're in the position where um, America has had a long resistance to, to believing what the truth is about the coming race. 
it's a race between Trump and Biden. We're configured to do what we did again in a smarter way in some places um, because we've really redefined what campaigning models look like. We've re- we really redefined what 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 it really means to effectively campaign. And it used to be, and some of our critics are like, why are you spending a million dollars on broadcast television? That's the way it's done. It's not. It doesn't work that way anymore. Um, we target voters digitally. We target advertising digitally. And we're able to get in and drill down in places that that allow us individual levels of persuasion that we've never seen before in politics. So that's the, that's the, that's the quick story. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Well, I very comprehensive and um, you know, I'm, I'm glad you kind of brought up the internal stuff because I I think as you have used integrity to draw yourself away from what you used to do and form this, you still had to act with integrity with regard to your own organization. So you're very consistent in how that's gone. And look, a lot of people may see, uh, the ads, they may see uh, you and your uh, acerbic wit and think, wow, oh, you know, this guy, he's uh, he's just out to get people. Well, no, he's, he's actually, uh, what I've seen from you, Rick, is somebody who has a moral code, who operates by it, who hits hard when he has to. That's the business. But like you said, you keep it clean. And there's th- this notion that going after family members is okay now from the party of family values, <laughs> I might add. Right. And when you hear some of uh, Trump's lawyers complain about, oh, his children, please think of the children <laughs> and, and, yeah. and their okay. legal woes. It's like, well, they're grown adults, for one. They've been given positions mm-hmm. within the family company and within the White House itself. Well, of course, they're fair game now. Look, look I, I, there, here's the distinction. My son was in high school and my daughter was in college when I started opposing Trump. And they both went through absolute hell. Uh, um, they were civilians, definitionally. And, and even, though, even though I have sworn that I will never let these people ha- skip one day of my whip in their asses, I've never once attacked Baron Trump. Not one time. Yeah. Not a single word has ever come out of my mouth about Baron Trump. Because you know what? He's a kid. He's not. A, he's not. He's not. Uh, he's not in the fight. Now Don Jr. and and Eric and Jared and Ivanka, they're in the fight. They are part of his op- Trump's operation, and they get no pass, no grace, no 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 moment of maybe I shouldn't punch them in the face, because they're in the business of promoting somebody who um who who's seeking to undo the american republic and i'm not gonna ever have a moment where i feel a second of hesitation against a shot against them that will do what i need it to do yeah and that be, means i don't attack ivanka just because i want to poke ivanka in the in the nose i attack ivanka because it makes trump himself crazy and takes him off his game and moves him into a space where I can manipulate Trump's emotions and behaviors. And, and as much as people, as much as people don't like, you know, hard hitting politics, they'll like the alternative a lot less. Yeah. They'll like, they'll like a world where Donald Trump um, is, is putting his political opponents in jail a lot less. Yeah. Yeah. And and here's where I kind of want to uh, get to the conclusion here. I think the way he's operated or the way the party is now starting to operate is uh, completely on the notion of grievances. And there's very mm-hmm. little policy anymore. It's just anti-democratic no, no. or anti-small D and large D democratic. Um, and, yes. and the old adage to me, uh, sticks out hurt people hurt people and uh-huh. I, I remember there, there was a quote from someone from your home state florida woman uh halfway through the trump presidency where she said he's not doing what we elected him to do he's not hurting the right people and i thought mm-hmm. how twisted do you have to be to elect someone to hurt other people and that gets to my question what the hell is wrong with america (laughs) that's 
I, I'm not sure we have enough hours in the day to run that down. <laughs> um, but I will, I will say uh, as a diagnostic, when you look at the scope of the scope of American society's alterations in the era of social media and in the era of verticalized political media that, that provides a sort of hermetically sealed media environment for people, it becomes easier and easier to radicalize them into believing that they're the oppressed class. You know, last time I checked, um, you know, the, 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 the guy driving his Ford F-250 uh, with the Trump flag on it, you know, driving a $90,000 truck with the Trump flag on it, um, uh, who, who, who stayed at the Willard Hotel when he came to, the, <laughs> to D.C. for January 6th, um, is not an oppressed class. Just, just the la- at least, uh, at least by my, re- my my reading of the situation. Um, but there's a lot about the world that that has made people profoundly um, susceptible to radicalization, and and all of us know people who fell in the Facebook hole and changed. All of us know people who fell in the Fox hole and changed, and none of None of those people um, meant to become apathetic to the to the pain of others. None of those people meant to um, become defined by cruelty, but they did in a way that that shocks the rest of us because of the effectiveness of social media to mm-hmm. isolate and radicalize, and because of uh, Fox and other elements of political media to isolate and radicalize. And in all those cases, in all those, in all those, um, you know, vectors by which people become infected with this, with this Trumpist virus, it does also play to certain like baseline human behavioral flaws. People want to be validated. People want to be, um, people want to be told that their opinion is correct. People want to be told that their prejudices are allowable. You know, I was in a focus group one time um, in 2016 in the summer and a guy leaned back and, and you would not have called this guy. You didn't, you wouldn't have seen this guy as like the pointy white hat club clan wearing, you know, hat guy. But he said, you know what? He goes, uh, I'm just sick of being able to not say anything I want to say. If I want to say the N word, I'm going to say it because Trump will be president. And I was like, that's all you want in your life. Wow. You just want permission to say the N word. You, you think Trump is going to give that to you and you're going to be a decent person or you're going to be a happy person because of that. And, and look, there is a, there is a, there's a long through line. My friend Stuart Stevens has written a brilliant book about this called it was all a lie um, about the racial through line in American politics. And Trump let that become a publicly facing definitional aspect of it. Um, and, and look, I'm from the South, uh, I'm from the deep South. I live in North Florida, which is a joke about in Florida. You know, the, the further North you go, the further South you get. I am around people who do not overtly consider themselves racists, but when Trump acts like a racist, they love it. They love it. They're like, that's the guy. That's my man. He's going to be, he's the one, you know, Trump's transgressiveness appeals to people with a falsely implanted sense of grievance about race and class. And it's hard to escape that. And it's hard to, uh, that's a weird kind of dopamine hit in our society that people really like. They like it when he's, you know, they, 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 they would say to you, I'm not that guy, but you know, when Trump goes out and says that wokeism, um, uh, Antifa, Black Lives Matter, all of these things give them a sense of validation for their own prejudices. And it, and it's, it's, it's an ugly thing. Yeah. And we're seeing it writ large with the owner of Twitter and I'm still calling it Twitter, by the way, I'm not calling it X. Um, Elon Musk playing Say, out. I, uh, I, to my <laughs> dying day, I will call it Twitter <laughs> <laughs> or to Twitter's dying day, which is, uh, seems like it's coming soon. You've got, you know, the, the owner who is probably the most influential person on the platform now openly being 
anti-Semitic and promoting anti-Semitic content, anti-Semitic uh, individuals, white nationalists, Nazis, etc. It's mm-hmm. it's coming at mm-hmm. us from every angle. They're just the ripping bare of the most base and vile portion of human nature. It, it, it is Elon's role at Twitter to platform and elevate and algorithmically enhance the worst of society is, and I wrote a piece about this on Substack yesterday, like who red pilled Elon? This is a guy who has been, who has been given everything by this country, who is, who is the richest man in the world, who is fabulously gifted by this nation. And, and that he promotes anti-Semitic racially, motivated hatred um, and, and promotes the worst of the worst on the platform for the, for the purposes of trolling. It isn't free speech. It isn't some uplift. It isn't some, some, you know, uh, anti woke agenda. It is a crude ancient slander against Jews. Um, and look, it, those things never, unravel on their own the market or society or or the or the or the political infrastructure has to punish those things they don't undo themselves they don't stop themselves they have to be stopped and you know and i i say this just nodding and winking a little bit to the biden administration he cares about his rockets which are a magnificent technological achievement he cares about the car company which is what funds his life you don't have to play ball with this guy the way you're doing it. You don't have to like accept this. You can make a, you can send a signal here and there like, you know, we're not going to have anti-Semites uh, being mass, massive government contractors, so either divest yourself or we're done. These sort of things are, are political hardball that Democrats have trouble playing, mm. um, and they're difficult to play sometimes. But, you know, it, bad people don't become less bad if you ignore it or coddle it or pretend that it's not happening. Great point. Great point, Rick. Well, uh, in the interest of keeping this, well, I'm not going to say brief, but uh, closing this <laughs> discussion down for now, because we could go on and on uh, and still not solve everything. But um, the podcast is Rick Wilson's The Enemies List, which you can find everywhere you get your podcasts. And of course, uh, you're just tearing it up on Substack right now. So uh, I, I highly suggest people subscribe to your Substack and you are at the Rick Wilson on all the major socials. Uh, what else should we be ready for from That's you, it. Rick? Well, um, we will be in the first part of the year getting into what we call fighting season in politics. And you're going to see a big uptick in the ad content from Lincoln attacking uh, Trump, who is going to be the nominee. You're going to see us trying to divide off the Republican base um, as we've done in the past. We've got a bigger pool to choose from now. Uh, that three to eight percent is now seven to eleven percent, depending on the state, um, for a lot of different reasons. More, more reasons than we have time for. Um, and other than that, it's going to be uh, a big year um, for 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 the country. It's going to be a year of, of decision making and of of commitment to whether we're going to have a democracy and a, and a and a constitutional republic. Because, you know, to, to modify James Carville's old phrase, it's the economy stupid. It's the fascism stupid in 2024. So that's where I'm, uh, that's where my head is at. I'm writing another book. Um, I am, I am, uh, I'm preparing for Thanksgiving and I'm turning 60 in a couple of days. So all these things are, uh, you know, big, big moments ahead. <laughs> hey, all right. I, well, love to be here with you celebrating. So that is all excellent news. Um, Rick Wilson, thank you for being on Timeless Leadership. Thank you, sir. Appreciate your time. Well, there you have it. Complex issues for a complex time. Uh, Through it all, I think the thing that we owe to Rick Wilson is his continued stand for his integrity. It's rare these days, unfortunately, that we see someone like this who has principles and who is willing to publicly stake his principles, to have the courage to not care 
what colleagues or friends or others might think. That's a hard thing to do. But if you know who you are and what you stand for deep down, and there's nothing that should get in the way of living by your values and by your principles. Our theme music is Americana Aspiring by Kevin McLeod. Thanks so much for joining us here on Timeless Leadership. And don't forget, the next time you have the opportunity to help someone dream more, learn more, do more, and become more, you, my friend, are acting like a leader. I'm Scott Monty. Thanks, and I'll see you on the Internet. <laughs>